Thank you so much. Can, can you hear me? Great. Uh, so uh, this talk, uh, which is very much um, coming together, a lot of um, help and support from um, Cameron and inspiration, as well as uh, Paul. There's um, uh, Ramsey of yesterday. Uh, I think there's a, a lot of convergence of what I'd like to talk about and what he was um, touching upon. Um, specifically around when he was speaking about the kind of ecosystem of, of um, open geospatial, um, what the cash economy looks like. And so um, I, I'm, I've, I've called this talk, like what are your salary requirements, like what is the, the value that we're going to create. Um, a lot of times the work that we do um, intersects with our paycheck. And uh, if it doesn't, we would like it to. So um, we're, we're gonna talk about um, what our own personal um, and global cash economy may look like. So I'm Alyssa. Um, I, I wanna give uh, part of uh, the kind of aesthetic inspiration uh, for this talk is very much um, the graffiti of Melbourne. Um, I've collected like a handful of imagery from the streets here, um, sometimes not, but I, I wanted to thank the city. I wanted to thank Cameron and the rest of the organizing committee for bringing me over here. It's amazing. Um, and there's uh, some circles that I hope to kind of touch upon as well. So thank you, and it's a great conference. Congratulations, and great food. So. Um, I've seen a couple of references here to Star Wars. Um, there's not going to be as much Star Wars or the hero kind of uh, uh, stuff, but I do want um, <laughs> to. Um, I'm not sure that's from Melbourne, but I hope there was a goat somewhere here, um, and uh, we all are. So um, I saw this quote not too long ago. Um, Open Geo can be a labor of love. I think all of us are passionate and committed um, to this world where, wherever we are, whether we're um, expert or beginner. Uh, but I, I think we can uh, recognize that um, love uh, doesn't pay the mortgage if, if you're looking for a mortgage um, or the rent. Um, it is, uh, there's, there's something else sort of coming in play. So uh, for me, Open Geo has always been a job um, I was introduced to the concepts of Open Geo um, within Open Geo, the company, um, with Paul, and um, has progressed on as a business development person um, in this space, both committed to the work um, and committed to my livelihood. And, and I imagine I'm not alone, that there are other people here who, who work um, in this Open Geo space. Uh, so, um, again, aesthetically, I'm going to keep the graffiti going. There is not graffiti of a job interview, but the format that I thought um, would be kind of interesting to explore in this um, presentation is the job interview. I mean, if you have ever had a job interview, uh, you can recognize that there's a ton of expertise on the internet, uh, not as much on Twitter as like the blog sphere, um, telling you how you should prepare for the interview. So. Um, I'd like to go through a handful of like the questions one should prepare um, when interviewing for an Open Geo job. Hopefully, you've seen them um, and inspired by them. So, uh, a couple more goats. Um, the canonical uh, recommendation uh, for preparing for a job interview is to know all the questions beforehand. Um, a little hard to, to make that happen. Um, and that's why they say to prepare for 30 questions. Um, I've taken uh, eight from that, that list of 30 questions and we're gonna kind of walk through that, them, sort of speaking about, again, what the job is um, of, of people who are <coughs> committed to OpenGL. So uh, one of the first questions, um, pretty much out of the gate, is uh, can you tell me a little bit about yourself? The, again, canonical um, advice in this, for this type of question is uh, to give your pitch. So here is my 
graffiti uh, reference. And there's a lot to say, I imagine, about like what one's pitch is. Um, so we'll just take it from LinkedIn. Um, that you know, I'm a startup professional. I work mostly um, in startups, which I'll kind of go through here. Some of my most recent experiences, um, and committed to like building um, an open world. So how did I hear um, about this job? Uh, I don't really know what this job is, but again, this convergence, this cash economy of uh, Open Geo um, and the paycheck. So. <coughs> Uh, the recommendation here uh, is to name drop as much as you can. So uh, get that list together for yourselves. Um, this is one of my circles. Um, it's this book. Um, this is my very first introduction to what a map is. I, I didn't grow up like reading an atlas. Maybe some of you did. Um, but uh, when I was 18, um, header, heading to university, um, I was uh, instructed to read this book called Maps and Territories. And um, it was by a professor at the University of Melbourne who, um, I, I think it was an art show about um, Aboriginal cartography. Uh, if you know him, I would be really. Uh, well, in, in remembrance. Um, <laughs> And if you want to see uh, the book, um, this is one of my few books in my bookshelf still. Um, at that point, I was a, a good student, and you can see highlighting here um, and notes in the um, margins. Uh, but this was my introduction to um, what, what it means to be a, a geographer. Um, and then, you know, since then, in terms of my professional career, I've had the um, really like the amazing opportunity to be part of, of many different startups. Um, and happy to talk about um, any of these, uh, but, but in terms of like one's journey, uh, my, my work in OpenGeo has gone from an abstract concept, um, something that I've learned like in, in university, uh, to in part, you know, not the only thing, but they're to a paycheck. So uh, to quote Paul from yesterday, um, and this is from the research that he pointed to by Nadia, um, I can't forget her last name. But open source, I think, and I think we can all recognize this, open source does not capture uh, the value that it often deserves. Uh, I don't know, you can read your, kind of, how you see this, but um, I'm very much into like sustaining um, open source, making it successful. Um, and for some reason, the Skiffy, um, says something to me. <laughs> it probably says something to you, but I, I didn't want to delete it, so. <laughs> okay, so next question. Uh, prepare for this. Um, what are your greatest professional strengths? Um, again, reference to the graffiti. So the, the recommendation here is to be accurate, relevant, and specific. They have uh, kind of a abbreviated jargon for this, but, but we're going to be accurate, relevant, and specific. So uh, one of my most recent like startups that I've been part of, um, and hopefully this is, I, I think it's kind of important um, that people, um, that's, that we're also innovating in the space of, of OpenGeo, just kind of aware, uh, even peripherally, of this conversation. But in the blockchain world, there is um, increasing um, inquiry into what it means to have space um, and how, how, do you, how do you make a location on the blockchain. And uh, I would say like one of my own professional strengths is that um, I don't know anything about blockchain really, um, and now I sort of know it like 5%. Um, and uh, so no expert, um, but, but have tried to figure out like what it means to have um, location um, on this blockchain. So I'm going to, in just a couple of slides. Um, first, explain what blockchain is and, and something that I think that we can learn about um, as an open geo community from, from this type of innovation. So again, to quote Paul, um, can the open source cash economy be done in a, another way? The economy of proprietary software and open source software cannot be reconciled. We need to begin recognizing uh, the value of communal property. Uh, what, one of the things about blockchain is that um, it's not only um, kind of a technological innovation and a legal kind of um, shift, but it's also 
um, a business shift. And uh, a lot of the conversation around blockchain is to how, how, to, how to create value um, in a different way. So I'm not saying that blockchain is responding to this, but I think it's something for us to, to think about. So I had the opportunity to be part of and advise um, a OpenGeo uh, blockchain startup called Foam. Uh, essentially what it does is combine a geo hash with a blockchain hash. There's a lot more that's there, but we'll, we'll start from there. <laughs> um, and, and some of the language of blockchain that really, um, uh, really, meant something to me, like that I really had to kind of um, think about and I still reflect upon, are these three words um, that you'll see a lot um, in the dialogue around blockchain and the dialogue around <coughs> geo-blockchain. Um, these three words are trustless, decentralized, that probably means something um, to us, and, and incentives. So to go through these um, three words, trustless. Um, don't trust a single entity in the digital network uh, whether that's a large bank, the cloud provider, or the single mapping company. For decentralized, uh, set up trust as a decentralized protocol to achieve consensus. So you trust the protocol, uh, you don't trust one another. And then um, how you put together trust in that protocol is to incentivize uh, good behavior. So again, whatever that means to you, uh, just think of the words trust decentralized and incentives um, to under kind of think about what blockchain means. And so when it comes to incentivizing, like how do you incentivize um, this kind of decentralized protocol? You maybe can see from like uh, the background, but one does it uh, through financial rewards. So um, money is a really big part of how uh, uh, you're constructing uh, this decentralized network. So not free time, like we've talked about before, um, but because people are getting paid to do this. So I would say here, uh, again, in reference to the cash economy that like Paul was talking about, that there's um, a, a, a equality um, that money um, equals enlightenment. I think, it, uh, I think that brings up a lot of questions um, and uh, yeah that what value means and what uh, a blockchain economy may look like so moving on uh, what is your greatest professional achievement um, this is the recommendation here is uh, don't be shy uh, really enjoy yourself um, be, be proud so I'm going to point to um, I've been one of the things I've uh, again had the an opportunity to be part of and that I'm really um, uh, just, uh, yeah, it means something to me, um, are, are these series of events that bring people together. And so I've been part of um, OpenStreetMap US for many years um, and was the, one of the lead organizers for, I think, five conferences as well as the Foster G um, that happened uh, this summer in Dar es Salaam and um, part of the um, founding of, of map time. And one of the things that kind of brings all that together um, is OpenStreetMap. And one, one, one of our, I'll give you an OpenStreetMap US like update, um, something that's I think quite significant in the dialogue of OpenStreetMap is that the state, um, sorry, the, the US chapter just hired an executive director. And so uh, we, we, Hope that this will bring um, the entire conversation of OpenStreetMap forward, um, similar to how HOT has done that with OpenStreetMap um, and humanity considerations. And so um, this is a step that the International Foundation is, is looking at closely, and I hope that it inspires like, other um, uh, OpenStreetMap uh, chapters around the world to think about what it means to have paid staff um, bringing this work forward. And so how did we, do this, how are we able to hire uh, somebody? Um, there wasn't a VC investment that's um, giving us the runway. And so there, are, um, when, again, everything is nuanced, but two things that I'll point to is a commitment um, of a community um, and the people that are always behind um, all these projects. But also I wanna recognize um, and really point to the companies that have been part of this conversation. 
Um, OpenStreetMap um, is, um, I mean, it's funded <coughs> by a, many different stakeholders with um, many different um, uh, pockets behind them. And uh, it's from uh, their support, um, as particularly during the conferences, that have allowed us uh, to be able to hire an executive director. And so there's a real tension um, with, this, with this presence of, of companies, of private companies. And, and we'll point here, um, I think it's a little surprising that we see um, some, some names here that aren't necessarily part of the OpenStreetMap community um, uh, the way one might expect. Um, everything from Esri to here, um, even to like Mapbox is shifting um, uh, work in OpenStreetMap. And yet they're all, all committed, I, I think, to being part of this ecosystem. And so, you know, what does that look like um, for, for maybe us as individuals um, and us as uh, employees of these companies as well? So there's a real tension, uh, and I, I want to acknowledge that both in uh, the U.S. Um, community as well as the international community. Um, if people aren't familiar with Simon Poole, I, he's a, a wonderful guy. He's part of the uh, licensing working group committee, um, working group that I'm part of. Um, at, but but he, he did kind of point to uh, this tension uh, during the last conference that we had. Um, in, in this type of quote that led to, again, a, a larger conversation of, about um, the place of, of companies um, in conferences. Uh, he is a former president of OpenStreetMap Foundation um, and a, kind of a, a recognized leader from its very beginnings. So I, I just, I, again, I want to point to uh, a tension that I think always exists um, with uh, the companies and the individuals, and, and what, what does that mean um, for, uh, again, this cash economy that we're all part of when, when we speak about OpenGeo. So, some questions for us to, to think about. Um, I, I would uh, encourage us to consider that these larger companies are sincere in their open efforts. They're doing the best that they can, uh, similar to ourselves. Um, I, I wonder if, you know, we talk a lot about diversity um, and that um, different uh, genders, different colors, um, different ages should be um, in, in our rooms. Um, I wonder if uh, when we talk about the diversity of stakeholders, we, we, we should not separate what we mean by community, um, by w where you're coming from uh, and, and where companies look like, and maybe that's um, another form of diversity that we can think about. Um, maybe there's no such thing as a, as a project being too corporate. Um, one of the complaints uh, for uh, State of the Map U.S. is specifically is that they're, quote, too corporate. Um, uh, maybe there's no such thing. Um, maybe you also are part of these uh, companies um, and that you're interested in, in working and not volunteering your time. Um, and so, you know, what does that look like? And uh, Paul pointed out to, I think it was, the, the Linux kernel, like how much these companies um, and the individuals that are part of them are, are the core contributors um, to all of this work. And so again, I'll just pose these as questions. These are questions that I, I think about um, often and I don't have a, a clear resolution, but I, I think that these are kind of trends that are happening in our space um, that uh, we can uh, move the conversation forward around. Um, I'll, I'll go back to like the, the term trustless. Uh, from the blockchain um, and where trust like fits into that conversation of co companies being part of um, our open geo communities like maybe um, we trust one another um, and we trust the institutions that we're part of um, and that this is like an avenue towards uh, valuing uh, communal property. So I think for me, all of this uh, speaks to a, a, a tension that I've been kind of referencing um, and a and conflict um, in our work, a conflict that's happening uh, potentially on a personal level. I mean, I can speak to that, but also um, in our ecosystem level. So um, this is essentially the canonical research here is to get real. Um, and I, I, I want to talk about that. 
So, um, as Paul said yesterday, um, institutions are not different than individuals. Um, and the institutions that are part of our communities um, are, are also individuals um, that, are, that are part of our work. And so some of the tensions that I've seen um, being part of uh, these companies and this work for, for a number of years, um, uh, so startups. Um, startups may um, start uh, with a very like, clear uh, commitment um, to open source. Um, and then as uh, they have the responsibility um, to pay their employees, as well as um, uh, uh, Accountability um, to particular like VC funding, um, they may uh, pivot um, and and from that uh, kind of black and white commitment towards open. And I, I think that we could all point to that you know staying true to course just just doesn't happen um, in the startup space. So I, I would pose in terms of like questions here about like the kind of tension that we see in the startup space. Um, I've, I've met, particularly in like a business development role, um, so many people coming out of like MBA um, degrees that are applying um, more traditional models of, of profit um, to open source, and I, I, would, I would wonder if it really directly applies. Um, I do think uh, VC investment, um, traditional VC investment, can, can complicate uh, what it means to be committed to um, OpenGeo. Uh, Again, Paul kind of touched upon this as well. Like, I mean, the support contract um, sort of paradigm seemed like uh, the perfect solution. Like, what, is that, what does that really mean? And again, some questions for us to think about. And then you have on the other side a conflict or a tension of like larger companies um, all of a sudden becoming open. Um, and, and what does that really look like? Uh, sometimes that means that they you know, put a um, a project on GitHub, and now they're committed to open. Uh, I think more often than not, they write large checks and uh, and say that they're um, open. Uh, I think as much for a marketing um, uh, recruiting uh, efforts, uh, as well as potentially, like we were saying before, sincere um, in 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 trying to think about uh, their their profit and open geo. So I'll refer back to the, the kind of last questions that I, I brought up and not because I'm running out of time. You know, look at them when you want. So I, I point to, uh, so that there's a lot of innovations that are happening here um, in different types of, of business models. Um, and one of them is this uh, company called Tidelift who is uh, started by a handful of Red Hat people and the author of the ODBL license. Uh, so um, has a kind of geospatial kind of history as well. It's called Tidelift, um, and it sort of serves as um, that insurance, that uh, a middleman um, between uh, larger companies and uh, supporting particularly smaller projects um, uh, of open source um, commitments. And so uh, if you're a maintainer, um, you can be uh, sort of paid to kind of continue your work uh, through this like Tidelift ecosystem. Um, and encourage you to, to look at it because maybe it's a sort of right space for, for yourselves. Um, they're currently committed a million dollars um, to supporting smaller projects. Uh, so why is this important? Like why is it that I, I think it's important that we, we um, consider like the cash economy and creating value um, for the, the works that we're committed to um, in all the different ways that it might look like? Um, for me, um, this kind of says it all. Again, I'm coming from the US. Um, this is a, a big person that we often stand in the shadow. Um, I will also say that when looking up Melbourne graffiti, um, this was probably the most popular uh, kind of search. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, street art happening uh, around the Trump administration. Um, and uh, you know, fundamentally, when it comes to technology and when it comes to um, uh, profit, I think we live, and, and power and privilege, um, I, I think the world is pretty messed up. So, um, some quotes. Uh, the sense that the end of times are near has never been more obvious to those in the tech business. The brilliant digital minds who told us that we were changing the world for the better have miscalculated. <laughs> and this is uh, from Kara Swisher. Um, she is, um, I don't know, uh, 
a journalist um, in the Rico Decode and, and New York Times, um, and uh, we are, I think we are at a crossroad um, as technologists, um, large and small. Another quote, uh, you might have seen this one. Um, so, now more than ever, as leaders and citizens, we must ask ourselves a fundamental question, uh, what kind of world do we want to live in? And this is from Tim Cook when he made his um, most recent like Apple announcements. Um, and again, I, we're technologists, we're um, <coughs> employed, uh, and we're also citizens. And, and I think we um, can right now like think critically uh, about what that means. Um, and, and I will argue uh, that I, I think open geo, uh, more so than any other like um, technology uh, field, is, is particularly well positioned um, to be leaders in this space. Uh, I think as a profession um, and as a passion, we have often thought about uh, micro realities. Um, you know, what does my community look like? What does crime um, look like? How is climate going to change? Like we're I live, um, but also global realities. I, I, the understanding of um, the world, uh, whether it's blue marble or um, something else, uh, a projection, um, or what a border looks like, I, 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 or how what land might look like from another person's perspective. Um, these are sort of global questions as well that I don't, um, I don't think many uh, professions um, always balance. And so, um, and Cameron pointed this out when we were talking, you know, there's a lot of history um, in this space specific to OpenGeo um, that I, I, I would wager that the rest of um, technologists are also kind of managing. Um, one is we've long managed huge data sets of people in place. Somebody once told me that uh, we're the original big data um, before it was even named. Uh, we have long considered data privacy and security. Again, this connection of people in place um, has always made us uh, think about um, what, what, it, what it means to be an individual um, and as a group. Uh, we have multiple perspectives. This is, um, you know, we understand what a projection is um, and that the world is constantly changing. It's constantly in flux, as are the people um, that are part of it. So again, uh, I would point to a Venn diagram. Like we are in a sweet spot. I mean, I encourage us to um, to continue to sort of um, build our network internally, but also uh, to turn our perspective um, to a, a larger conversation of what it means to be um, in in technology right now. And so. Uh, Second and last question, I think. So where, where do you see yourselves in, in five years? Um, again, I believe this is a famous Melbourne uh, graffiti. Um, and the recommendation here is, you know, be honest, be honest with everything, um, and that it's okay not to say, not to be quite sure what uh, your own personal uh, future may hold. And I will say I've never had a five-year plan kind of Moving along, uh, I've been asked this for every job interview I've ever been part of, um, and I hate this question. I, I just don't have an answer. Um, if you do, uh, please come up and, and talk to me. But um, I will say that I, I, I do think our, our future, um, I'm sorry, that's part of our future, but I do think our future is something that we can recognize, again, internally, when it comes to our job in OpenGeo, as well as um, externally of being part of this larger ecosystem is this asymmetry of power. I mean, who creates value? Um, who, who, who's the, I don't know, there's a lot of asymmetries of power. And so um, I, when kind of unpacking what a cash economy could look like, um, that we also uh, think about um, these, these places of power um, and money and privilege. So um, there's this uh, recent thing that I read that the, the the move fast and break things um, of startup uh, uh, innovation is no longer relevant, and that instead um, we should move um, purposeful, pur move purposeful and fix things. Um, and I, I, again, I think that for me, um, part of why I I love this community um, and been part of it. Um, both professionally and, and personally, is that I, I think that this is an ethos um, that, that drives 
uh, much of our work. So, next question. Oh, first of all, uh, Happy Thanksgiving uh, to any Americans out here. Uh, this uh, amazing, uh, again, street art in Melbourne. Um, uh, not graffiti, but uh, down the block from where I'm staying, um, they are selling a very beautiful um, oven uh, with this turkey inside. And so this is my uh, celebration of Thanksgiving. I encourage you all um, to grab some uh, inflatable turkey um, and celebrate together. And then, uh, you know, uh, at the end of every interview, uh, if you get to that, um, they ask, uh, do you have any questions for me? So, um, workers of the world, relax. I mean, I, I think we have a lot to do. Um, but uh, also, um, it hopefully comes with uh, fun uh, along the way um, and, and, and questions. So, I encourage them. Um, so, we, we're in this job interview thing, um, has, has the conversation around openness changed over the last 10 years or so? Have, have, can you now mention an open interview job interview now? Oh, um, I mean, I guess it always depends on what job you're applying for, um, and uh, there seems to be a lot more um, openings uh, for uh, technologists that have experience um, and committed to open. For me, um, uh, open has been as much about um, open code, um, open data, open source uh, protocols, as well as um, open processes. Um, and, and perhaps that's my like largest uh, interest and commitment, commitment is that uh, we're able to be um, transparent with each other um, and open. Um, both around like the areas of conflict um, as well as uh, the innovations that we might be moving towards. So I, I would say yes. Okay. Is my Just a really quick question. Um, do you find that, uh, what, what's more important? Um, no, knowing the, the detail, so knowing the, the technical side of things or um, being able to talk to others about those things? Um, and being able to translate from, I guess, tech speak to, to business speak? Oh, um, I think that's a really good question and I even would turn it around. In, in terms of, um, I think uh, business leaders need to talk tech speak. Um, I, I think yeah. that there's like, um, maybe similar to the kind of origins of open source that there is siloing um, and one of the Kind of powers of open is to, to bridge those silos um, uh, and, and companies and uh, um, you know replication of projects and and um, I, I think that business people um, need to uh, partner um, with with technologists a lot more and, and they're not I mean I'm not a programmer um, at least in in, in the traditional sense um, but. Uh, I, I'm sure, maybe you've seen like the cartoon where a salesperson goes out and um, they're like, it's, we have everything figured out, you know, it's just magic um, and, and they don't need to know the technology and that's sort of, um, I think like trained ignorance uh, is, 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 is part of what's misleading um, this space. Like, um, and, and I do think that technologists should, should also be partners, I mean partners, equitable partners, um, in with business leaders as well. And so I, I would, I, of those two things that you listed, I, I would actually say that the, the language of being able to speak with one another um, is the most important. So if you are a technologist, um, I, I do encourage you to, like primarily technologists, I would encourage you um, to, to have lunch with your business person, um, and if you are a business leader, um, to, to do the same with your technologist um, and, and start thinking about the, the bridges. Um, <coughs> I do think that bridges will allow us um, to, 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 to solve um, in multiple ways uh, this cash economy. Uh, just listen, thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, I just was thinking about it and thinking, do you think some of this openness, including blockchain, is a response to a very high pressure to adapt? 
on humans because I, there I is a bit you. of um, research suggesting networks work faster than protocols in big business. Well, it's funny. Um, I, I think blockchain um, is, a, is a response uh, to, to where we find ourselves culturally. Um, I, I think that there's growing, and, and I know Australia has its own um, uh, political complications as well. Um, I, I think that there's um, a growing um, distrust, and again, I'll point to the word distrust, um, a growing distrust of our governments um, and our and the the large uh, companies that are leading us, and so uh, thinking about decentralized and and we're part of that conversation. Like thinking about decentralized, I think is a response to um, our our lack of trust. I I, it's, I mean I'm probably not tech, technically um, you know, deep enough to to respond to that specific um, question, but I, I think um, I think uh, I think that we're we're in a crisis of, of trust. Another question, Mark? It's in, in a way a segue uh, question. I was wondering if you ever had a question or how you sh we should answer a question where uh, the interviewer would ask, what are your ethical limits or where you don't want your contributions to go? Uh, anything special can be used for common good or it can be used for defense military. I don't know what that you might not agree with. Yeah. So have you encountered such a question and, and what would be your suggestion? Right. Uh, I've never encountered that. Uh, question, but I have um, worked in places where um, uh, kind of the idealism of of why we're all all there um, didn't align with the the, the business um, that was paying our our, our paychecks, and um, I and, and we were becoming more uh, kind of geo intelligence focused. Um, and yeah, and as, sorry, I don't know if it's but in the efforts of transparency, you know. Um, so that was Open Geo um, as it kind of um, shifted to Boundless, um, and I think Boundless uh, is is um, comfortable in their identification of a military contractor. Um, people who joined Open Geo, particularly at its beginnings, um, I don't think any of us were like, we want to be military contractors when we grow up, you know. And, um, and, and so this was a shift that we were all part of, like we all, you know, were agents in, um, and and I think also encouraged uh, many of the, the people that joined because of a commitment to, to open um, at its beginnings uh, to, to think about. And um, w one thing that was sort of um, helpful for me in that conflict of, so again, uh, the conflict was committed to open and a little, unsure about where the money was coming from. Like, you know, uh, again, this was the, the US military uh, often. And um, I was at a, a, a memorial in, in New York um, of Aaron Schwartz, if people are familiar with him. He's um, a open source hero um, that uh, um, passed away um, very young, and there were um, <coughs> memorials all over, all over the world kind of um, celebrating his, his work. And um, I was at this um, memorial, and uh, somebody spoke about what made him such a powerful um, hero and advocate and, and community creator um, of, of Open was at his ability to bridge. And, um, and that there are, are people um, that may be on the outside of these companies, and there are people like in the inside, um, and they are not only advocates about bringing open source um, uh, into the direction of the companies, but um, of of being connected uh, to what's happening on the outside. And, and I and I, I thought that um, it's important that in these worlds of um, that might be complicated that that there are good people there, you know, that they're, that we're there, um, and, and that we're, we're, we're finding um, uh, bridges. So, so never ask that, but I, I think everybody finds that conflict. Yeah. 
Yeah. <coughs> question in front of the One of the hardest parts in interviews happens to be the next question is very much a 180 process. And in a sense, you're on the other side. And one of the hard parts of entering into a business is that this is a very conditioned <laughs> experience. And one of the hardest parts is knowing how 360 the relationship is going to be afterwards, because that's the real el element of, of real community and real trust. Yeah. And I'd argue that predominantly most of the large corporations in the world with the HR department simply absolutely hope so. Uh, absolutely absolutely right. hope so. The hopeless. Oh. There's very little in the way ever of a 360 uh, relationship, both with your professional reviews. So yeah. how can one elucidate? Is, how, how does one who's sitting on the other side uh, get some idea of, of what they're going to enter into and how much they're going to help you help me? Yeah, um, that's a really good... Um, uh, yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, and that's maybe um, one of the difficult parts of people that are, are um, have a history of being in an open community um, where there's snarkiness and criticism and complaint um, go, going into, um, and I think there's 360 in these worlds, um, of, of going into a job interview where that's not um, part of the, the history and the ethos. Um, and uh, I feel like I face that. Yeah, I'm not sure I have an answer because um, I, I feel like I face that. And uh, would maybe say that uh, whether you get the job, like if you're open and 360 um, and uh, you get the job, I think that's a good signal. If you don't get the job, um, maybe point to that, that this is you know, not the space that um, really, really values uh, both open business, open uh, code, um, and open um, dialogue. Okay, we'll probably end there. Um, I can hear the uh, coffee cups in the background. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, on behalf of everyone here, I'd like to thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>